Well, grace to you and peace. Good morning. Uh, as most of you probably know, mask wearing is now optional, and uh, for those of you who feel comfortable not wearing a mask, it's good to see your faces, and for the first time in a while. Well, this is um, a welcoming, affirming, inclusive congregation uh, made up of people who are at all points on the journey, some full of a lot of strong faith, some full of doubts and questions, some in the middle. Anyway, you're in good company. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning. Um, I know that Presbyterians can read, and I hope you do read, and you can read your insert, and I hope you read the spire, uh, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of, a couple of things. Almost everybody knows we have a food cart here. Uh, every Sunday, we welcome you to uh, bring non-perishable items that we will then get to uh, people who distribute it to people in need. So we don't take it down the aisle like we have in the past before the pandemic, but it's here. So please make use of it if you can. Also, this is uh, Lent. And so in the season of Lent, every Monday, there's a Lenten service that the downtown churches take turns hosting. And so tomorrow, the Lenten lunch will be at... Um, Immaculate Conception and uh, our own Presbyterian Phil Blackburn will be preaching and the service begins at 12.15. No lunch this year because of the pandemic, but the service is at 12.15, so if you can come then. You probably know, I just want to highlight, we have glass recycling receptacles in the back. So you can drive up, drop off all your glass beverage containers and food containers. It'd be nice if you rinsed them out a little bit so we keep the bug population down. But you don't have to remove labels. Just bring your glass here and we'll recycle it. Also, because of what's happening in Ukraine, we're having a fundraiser for Ukraine in which we're making a Ukrainian supper. It's going to be stuffed cabbage, which is their traditional dish, and borscht, which is like a beet soup, and a roll. So please order, pre-order by this Wednesday, pre-order. You can determine the amount that you'd like to donate for that meal, and we will direct those funds to Mercy Corps. Uh, so that the whole community can participate and not just a Presbyterian thing. But um, you can come by then on Friday between 5 and 6 at the... Uh, Lecta Avenue entrance to the church and pick up your meal. If you would like to donate without picking up a meal because you don't like stuffed cabbage and beet soup, fine. Just make a donation and we will be happy to uh, send it on to people in Ukraine. Uh, you can sign up by emailing the church, calling the church, or by going to the church website where there is a form that you can fill out online. Okay. So let's take a moment now to think about why we're here. What we do when we come together is we draw our conscious awareness of God's presence. We believe we're all, always in relation to God and God is everywhere. But at this time, we focus our awareness on God's presence. And so we set our intention to be fully present. And in order to be mindfully present, we take just a moment to become centered by first taking a deep cleansing breath and then bringing the focus of our attention to our normal breathing, which helps us to become centered and mindfully present. Amen. So I did not give you an opportunity to say what your concerns are, so I want us to do that right now so that we can lift up our concerns in our prayer time. Yeah, Becky? Yeah, David King's son, Bruce, is in, in ICU having had a heart procedure and very serious condition. Any others? Okay.
Good morning. Please stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship. God desires to gather us. She gathers us together, her wings spread out before us, her presence all around us. To nurture is her nature, to mother is her gift. For our safety, she reaches, for our good, she moves, sheltering over us. She is the refuge deep under hot wings. She is our strength. In her, we find our justice. In her, we find our peace. Let us pray. O oh God, we pray that in the elements of earth, sea, and sky, we may see your beauty. That in the wild winds, birdsong, and silence, we may hear your beauty that in the body of another and in the intermingling of relationship we may touch your beauty, that in the moisture of the earth and its flowing and fruiting we may smell your beauty, that in the flowing waters of springs and streams we may taste your beauty. These things we look for this day, O oh God. These things we look for. Amen. seated.
Join me in imitating all who have gone before us, who trusted that if they spoke of the ways in which they had missed the mark, God would not only hear them, but forgive them. Let us pray. O oh God, we live in a culture that has normalized structural evils in many forms. We acknowledge and turn from all the ways we have chosen to look the other way. For our failure to lament over the suffering caused by greed, by militarism, by racism, and other structural evils, we acknowledge and turn from moral apathy. For preferring the comfort of the status quo more than the painful work of self-examination, we acknowledge and turn from spiritual apathy. For our fragility, when conversations get too close to home, for getting offended when we should be repentant, we acknowledge and turn from our ego-centered reactions. Merciful God, and by your spirit, we ask you to help us respond to your lure to become better versions of the people you made us to be. Now, let us continue our confession by taking a moment in silent prayer so that we can confess the ways in which we have personally missed the mark against God and our neighbor. Hear and receive the good news. Our God has been faithful through generations. Our God makes all things new. Our God makes gardens spring and wounds repair. In God's love, we are made whole. In God's mercy, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. May we be open to hearing from you, O God, as we hear from these words of Scripture, our wisdom tradition. Amen. Our reading is from Isaiah chapter 49 verses 14 through 16. The city of Jerusalem, here called Zion, stands for the nation of Israel. Israel believes that God has forsaken her, but God, like a mother, gives reassurance. Let us listen for God's message to us. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hand.
A reading from Psalm 27, verses 1, 4 to 5 in Korean. 여호와는 나의 빛이요 나의 구원이시니 내가 누구를 두려워하리요 여호와는 내 생명의 능력이시니 내가 누구를 무서워하리요 내가 여호와께 바라는 한 가지 일 그것을 구하리니 곧 내가 내 평생에 여호와의 집에서 살면서 여호와의 아름다움을 바라보며 그의 성전에서 사모하는 그것이라 여호와께서 환란 날에 나를 그의 초막 속에 비밀히 지키시고 그의 장막 은밀한 곳에 나를 숨기시며 높은 바위 위에 두시리로다 아멘 Our message text is from Luke 13, beginning with the first verse. So let us listen again for God's message to us. At that very hour, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today and tomorrow and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. These are the words of Scripture. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Killing your opponents is one of the oldest human tactics. You know, the biblical story that starts in that perfect, peaceful, harmonious garden very quickly moves on to a scene of fratricide as Cain kills his brother Abel for no justifiable reason. By the time we get to the flood story, the narrator says the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. The tactic of killing your opponents figures large in the text we just read from Luke's gospel. The Pharisees tell Jesus that Herod wants to kill him. And that threat seems likely because Herod has already killed John the baptizer over fear of the crowds that he was raising and of his criticism of Herod's practices. Jesus then brings up the killing of prophets in Jerusalem as a truism, almost, like it's to be expected. We need to remind ourselves that the Christian symbol is the cross, which is an execution device. Crosses were the way the Romans lynched their opponents, and they did it by the thousands, as ancient historians tell us. I believe it's important to acknowledge that Jesus died on a cross, not on a battlefield, because he would not take up arms, even in self-defense, meaning he chose to die rather than to kill. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus today? If we set out to follow Jesus, I believe we must first understand him. This text from Luke's gospel reveals important aspects about both Jesus' mission and his motivation. So we're going to look at it together for those two facts. 
First and most obviously, but often neglected or even suppressed by today's modern versions of Christianity, Jesus' mission was public, not just private. What do I mean? The private aspects or the personal aspects of Jesus' teaching are hugely important, of course, but they are not the end of the story. Yes, Jesus cared about our prayer life, uh, about our financial stewardship, about our arrogance and about our need to forgive people, all kinds of personal spiritual issues. But he also cared about big public and political issues. If he were not concerned about those kinds of issues, then why would Herod have him under surveillance? The fact that Herod, Herod Antipas, who ruled Galilee, was out to kill Jesus means that Jesus was a threat to him. No one has ever been executed for preaching love and forgiveness. But many prophets, as tradition has it, were killed. Why? Because they were unafraid to speak truth to the people in power when they were wrong. They called out governments so many times. One little example, Isaiah. He called out the governments who, he said, make iniquitous decrees, who write oppressive statutes, who turn aside the needy from justice and rob the poor of my people. Laws, unjust laws. In that same prophetic tradition, Jesus was willing to call Herod a fox. Not a term of flattery, but a critique of his duplicitous nature. Herod had John the baptizer killed, and now he has Jesus in his sights. It's important, I believe, to keep in mind that Jesus chose the metaphor for his mission as a political metaphor. He called it the kingdom of God. He didn't have to. He could have chosen other metaphors. He could have chosen the metaphor of the household of God or the building of God. Those were metaphors that Paul used, but he didn't. Jesus, in direct challenge to the kingdoms of his time, the kingdom of Herod Antipas, the kingdom of Caesar and Rome, called his agenda, his ethics, his standards, a kingdom, so that if God is king, then God's standards, God's ethics are to be followed on earth as they are in heaven. So it was a public and political action that Jesus was on his way to perform in the text that we just read from Luke's gospel. At this point in Luke's gospel, Jesus is actually on a journey outside of Galilee, outside of the realm of Herod's jurisdiction, because he had a plan. He had a mission. He called it his work. As the culmination of his ministries of exorcism and healing, he would go to the temple in Jerusalem and shut it down. This is what they call an acted parable. It was a teaching by demonstration. The temple, you will recall, was also the national bank. It was the location that housed the records of the indebtedness of the population, most of whom were peasants, many of whom by the thousands were being forced off of their land by the aristocratic families that were in control of the temple. And Jesus acted in opposition to that oppressive system. It was a public act. It was a political act. And the threat was recognized as a threat. Now, the kingdom of God may not have had an army but it did have people power that was taken seriously by both the aristocratic families and the Roman government that ran the temple. It is clear from this text that Jesus accepted the risk that he was taking. He didn't flinch 
from the news that Herod was out to kill him. He did not cancel his plans to go to Jerusalem because of the danger there. Just like Dr. King many years later who would suspect that he may not get to the promised land of equality and freedom with his people, he kept his eye on the prize in spite of the death threats. If we want to follow Jesus, we must recognize this about his sense of mission. Unlike a lot of middle-class Christianity, Jesus was not timid. Dr. King learned from Jesus. He answered the objections of the southern white ministers who are, urged him not to hold demonstrations for voting rights. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, he replied, they advised him to wait, but he replied that waiting always ended up meaning never. Waiting was timidity that the urgency of the day would not allow. If we want to follow Jesus, it is also important not just to look at his mission, which was both public and political as well as private, but to look also at his motivation because this text highlights that so beautifully. Many people who have been subject to oppression operate out of a well of resentment. They want vengeance. They want to make the people who caused their suffering to suffer likewise. They want revolution. Justice for them is retributive. Resentment was not Jesus' motivation. This text so beautifully shows Jesus' motivation for opposing oppression was to seek restorative justice. He did not wish for the demise of his enemies. He wished for their redemption. He cared for them. So he used the metaphor of a mother hen. He said, I desire to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. It is obviously a feminine image. We've been watching those scenes of Ukrainian women by the thousands cradling their wrapped up little babies as they try to flee on trains and buses to escape the murderous Russian attacks. Mothers instinctively risk everything to care for their children. It's what mothers do out of compassion. And Jesus wanted to protect his people from themselves. So like Isaiah before him, he used feminine images of compassion using the words that were, the image that was similar to what Isaiah used that we just read. Can a woman forget her nursing child? or show no compassion on the child of her womb. So Jesus, like a mother bird, wanted to spread wings of protection over his people. But he knew that he probably would not be able to help them. He knew that they were resistant to his message. He said, I desired to gather you together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. Jesus had been preaching things like, blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus told his people that just like the Galilean rebels who Pilate had killed, he said, unless you change your thinking, you will perish just the way they did. Jesus saw the revolt coming that eventually started in 66, and he knew if the revolt started, it would end disastrously. He had motherly compassion on even the aristocratic families, the Roman collaborators whose house was going to come down around their own heads if they didn't change. He preached, in other words, non-violence, but not passivity. He preached non-violent, active resistance because he had compassion on the people. So we must notice that even though Jesus was aware of the unlikelihood of his success, nevertheless, 
He persisted because faithfulness, not success, was his quest. If we are to be followers of Jesus, our motives for working for justice, working against oppression and discrimination, working for the positive values of the kingdom of God must always and only be motivated by compassion. We want redemption, not vengeance. We want restorative, not retributive justice. And we will keep working for a just and equal society even if the chances this election cycle seem limited. Faithfulness, not necessarily success in the near term, is what's going to prompt our action. We will not wait. We will not be intimidated. We will be inspired by Jesus' example. We will not let our faith merely be a purely private matter, but like Jesus, we will allow it to compel us to public action on behalf of people in need. Amen. Well, let us affirm the faith that gives us that vision, and we will use one of the confessions of the Iona community. So I invite you, if you're able, to please stand and let us say what we believe. We trust in God, whose love is the source of all life and the desire of our lives, whose love was given a human face in Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was crucified by the evil that wants to enslave us all, and whose love, defeating even death, is our glorious promise of freedom. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and full of doubt, in God we trust, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves in the service of others to seek justice and to live in peace to care for the earth, and to share the commonwealth of God's goodness, to live in the freedom of forgiveness and the power of the spirit of love, and in the company of the faithful, so to be the church for the glory of God. Amen. You may be seated. With gratitude to God for the gift of this moment, this community of faith, and this opportunity to give back, let us share our resources for the sake of this church and for the ministries we believe in. There is an offering plate available at the front of the church. You may also send in your giving or take advantage of electronic giving available at our church website. So now let us come to God in prayer for the needs of the world and the climate and our country and for the church and for people in particular need. So we'll use the response, O oh God of love, hear our, this is our prayer. Let us begin our prayer time with just a brief, deep breath to become centered and focused. O oh God of love, we come with gratitude for this moment, for this community of faith, for the signs of spring that we are already seeing right after this snowy time we've had, for the beauty of the earth and for the abundance of this good earth. We're so thankful. O oh God of love, this is our prayer. Oh God, we lift up our hearts in prayer for the world and all the ways people are suffering. We know that the pandemic continues. We've heard this morning reports of how it's raging now in Hong Kong and other places as well. And so we pray for all of the people that are suffering. And we pray for comfort for all the people that are grieving the loss of people that they that have loved and have lost. So for all of those, oh God of love, this is our prayer. We pray now, especially for peace in Ukraine. 
We lift up all of those who are suffering in so many ways because of this senseless violence. And we pray that there would be ways found to bring relief and peace to that country and refuge for the people who need respite from this terrible conflict. And as today we learn of the death of even an American journalist, we pray especially that this conflict will not widen to become even worse. O God of love, this is our prayer. We pray for our climate, which is changing and which is uh, in peril right now because of human action. And so we pray for wisdom and courage and boldness to act in ways that will help it not to increase in the, in the path that it's on now, but that our climate would be available to future generations so what our children and our grandchildren will not have to suffer the effects of further climate change. O oh God of love, this is our prayer. We pray for our country, which is still so deeply divided. But now as we have found this strange unity in our opposition to the violence that's happening in Ukraine, we pray that you would lead us to know ourselves as a nation that can work together for the common good. So we lift up all of our leaders, every everyone who's in a position of authority over us, our president and vice president and all who advise them and everyone who's in government. May we be led by people of integrity and honesty and creativity who work hard for the common good and especially on behalf of those who suffer in our country. O oh God of love, this is our prayer. We pray for the church around the world and for our particular Presbyterian branch of that church we pray that we would seek to follow Jesus in both public and private ways and that we would do everything in our power to be led by the Spirit so that we can be your hands and your feet and your vehicles for compassion and justice in our world. We pray for our particular congregation here in the River Valley. We ask your blessing on our ministries of mercy and compassion and we ask for your direction and discernment as we seek to find our way forward into the future, which we know will look different from the past, but we seek to follow you. O oh God of love, this is our prayer. We lift up our hearts in prayer for those who need you in a particular way. And today especially, we pray for Bruce King, who is in the hospital right now, and ask you your blessing on him and all the people attending to him. We ask for your grace for Joe Messina and for Katya in Nicaragua for Lassine and Denise, for um, Sana and George's mother, for Teresa's friend, for Sissy's son-in-law, for, for Jay, for Peggy and for Donna, for Kay McClellan and Michael and Glenda, for Sam and Paige. There's so many that need your care. We ask for your blessing on them and for others who we haven't named out loud. So we take this a moment in silence to name them before you. O oh God of love, this is our prayer, for we offer all of our prayers in the spirit of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, our invitation is that if you are part of this community and don't have a church to be a member of, then consider joining us as we seek to follow Christ here in the River Valley. As we come to our time of communion, there are several options now uh, available. If you have received the communion portion on your way in and you would like to receive communion that way, you are welcome to. If you feel comfortable, you are also welcome to come forward as Pastor Kim and I will distribute the bread and there is gluten-free bread available on this side. And then to receive the cup right then and there as you are here in the front before you return to your seat.
May God gather you around this table. And you as well. Let us bring our hearts to God. We offer them to the one who hears us when we sigh. Rejoice in the one who shelters us with grace. Our heads and hearts are lifted by a crowd's joy. O Creator God, whose love is the compelling power of the universe, whose creative call brings all things into being, whose purpose is the shalom of all creation, we come with gratitude for your grace. You made us and everyone in your image capable of consciousness and communication, to know and love and to give love, to be in community and in communion. And though we humans have missed the mark so often, Yet you continually call us back home with prophets and wisdom teachers. You lure us with the longing for union. Holy, holy, holy are you, God, our shelter and refuge. All creation manifests your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We bless you for Jesus who taught us to know you as the source of love, the source of goodness, the fountainhead of forgiveness. We give thanks for his life of compassion for all people and his example of lamentation over the destructiveness of evil. We give thanks for his life of solidarity with the suffering ones and his willingness to face death without fear, confident in your power to give new life. Great is the mystery we call faith. Christ has died self-sacrificially for his people. Christ lives in our hearts and in our community. Christ comes to us again and again, disguised as our life. Here in the bread and the cup, anointed by your Holy Spirit, we taste life and drink of grace. The brokenness of the bread is what makes us whole so we might challenge the powerful of our time and break their power over the vulnerable and the voiceless. The richness of the cup's hope fills us with your gifts to share. Hope for those who despair, comfort for all who grieve, and justice for the oppressed. And when all our words have turned to dust, your word will come again and gather us up in the shelter of your eternal grace and glory, where we will forever sing your praise, O God in community, holy in one. Amen. On the night before he met with death, Jesus came to the table with those he loved, and he took bread and he broke it among his disciples, saying, Take and eat, all of you. This is my body given for you. So do this remembering me. And when the supper had ended, he took a cup of wine. And he gave thanks to the God of all creation. And he shared the cup among his disciples, saying, all of you drink of this. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, given for you for the forgiveness of sins. So these are the gifts of God for the people of God. So let us receive them with joy.
Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, how can we thank you for such a gift? For you have met us, fed us, drawn us to you, and bound us to one another. Now send us out to share your love and proclaim our living hope. Now, wherever you are going, God is sending you there. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose for you being there. Christ, who indwells you, has something he wants to do through you, where you are. So believe that and receive his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Peace.